Now, we oftentimes hear that our application process, but also our demands in terms of reporting and especially financial reporting are too complex. And honestly, I will not say that they are not demanding, because they are. Um, but I hope to explain at least to some extent why this is the case. I will be speaking mostly uh, from my experience with uh, cooperation projects, as this is uh, the scheme for which I'm uh, responsible. And I realize that there's uh, people with specific questions about literary translations and maybe uh, platforms. Um, all, not all that I will mention will be applicable to those uh, different schemes. But again, I'll try to help you uh, as best as possible. Good project management starts with a well-developed application. As you probably know, competition is fierce when applying for EU funding. As we have a very limited budget, and I really have to stress that we have an extremely limited budget, we want to make sure that we select the best of the best. And this is a congratulations to those that have received EU funding, because it means that you are part of a very small group of organizations within Europe who have succeeded in uh, applying for funding. As a European funding program, we must ensure that the projects we select will be successful and that they will contribute to the policy objectives of the program. Because our policy objectives are our raison d'être. If we cannot show to the European institutions, and then I'm talking about the European Parliament and the Council, that we actually do something to contribute to these policy objectives, our funding stops. So there are imperatives upon us which make that we have to demand certain things from our constituency. Applications which just contain a splendid ID but that present very little evidence of how this marvelous ID will be put into practice will just not make the cut in our funding scheme. Detailed project planning is a must, and this implies a well thought through estimated budget. But before I dive into the financial world, I would like to take some time to reflect upon the nature of cooperation projects, these international cooperation projects. In these projects, you and your partners will work around a topic which you all feel very passionate about. And obviously, this is something that we want to support because it's so enriching to work together across borders. However, it's also an exercise that cannot be underestimated. Managing a common project within one's own country, where different organizations with different missions, different management structures, different personalities, different organizational cultures work together is already a challenge. Add cultural differences, linguistic barriers, different financial management systems, and the sheer distance that exists between you, which doesn't allow you to meet face to face if a problem occurs. And then you have the type of project that we are funding. Even if everyone's intention to bring the project to a successful end is there, you will encounter challenges. You need to ensure that right from the start, everyone is on the same line. And not only on an artistic level, because that's usually not where the challenges lie. Um, not in the big ID behind the project, because everybody is very excited about it. But you need to agree on the details. Who will be responsible for what? What needs to be delivered when? Um, what are the principles of communication? Who will pay for what? How will cash flow? Um, what happens in case there is a change in the work program? So all these things need to be uh, developed right uh, from the start. That is why in the context of the cooperation projects, we ask you to develop not only a detailed description of the project, but also a very detailed estimated budget and a cooperation agreement, an extensive cooperation agreement, which lays down all these basic principles of cooperation. On the one hand, these documents are a bit selfish of us because they help us to evaluate the applications, always keeping in mind that it's a very competitive process. So we need to have enough flesh to the bones in order to allow us to do this assessment properly. 
But on the other hand, we also ask you to develop these documents um, to help you, because they will help you and your partners tremendously should the project be selected for funding. The negotiations that you will need to enter into with your partners to develop these documents will allow you to learn who you are working with. They will, they will equally help you to ensure that the project stays on track once the money is in, because oftentimes there is lots of enthusiasm in developing an ID, but once the money is there, things might shift a little bit. So you have a stable basis on which to work with. So the key to successful financial management, according to me, is first of all a well, a well thought through estimated budget. When you apply, you will need to present an estimated budget, which presents an overall picture of expenditure and income, but also a more detailed picture, at least for a cooperation project, of which partner is incurring which expenditure and contributing what amount to the project. Because you have to keep in mind that our funding is only there to complement your funding. We are contributing a maximum of 60 or 50% of the total cost of uh, the project, depending on whether you are applying for a small-scale or a large-scale pr uh, cooperation project. So the rest of the money is up to you to raise. This may come from income generated by the, pro uh, by the project, if you have ticketing uh, sales. Um, it can come from public or private funding or from your own pockets. That is really up to you. But you must also keep in mind that should you raise more money in the, framework, in the framework of your project, our contribution will diminish. Because projects that we fund must always function in a non-profit making capacity. Now, in order to establish uh, your estimated budget, you will need to discuss the project in detail with your partners and discuss its financial implications. It is important to work together with them to provide realistic estimates and to get the level of detail that is requested. How many artists will be traveling, where and when? For how many days? How many months will a project uh, manager work on the project? Will he or she be working full-time, part-time? So this is, the this is the level of detail uh, that, you, uh, that you need to provide. And in this exercise, you will always need to ensure that there is coherence between the project and the budget that you apply for. It's not very reassuring to see uh, a project that is um, focusing, for example, on the transnational mobility of artists, and then you open up a budget and you see that there is hardly any provision for travel and accommodation costs. This doesn't make sense. I mean, this is the easiest example, but we see quite a lot of those projects where there is a, a statement of intent in the description of the project, but it doesn't match in the budget. Obviously, uh, when you are applying, you will also need to consult our funding rules. Uh, these are detailed in the guidelines, and I will take you through some of these. But it's really important that you uh, develop a good understanding of these rules uh, when you are already um, making up or establishing your budget. Now, why do we request such a detailed budget? It shows careful project planning. Experts will be using it to assess whether the budget and human resources are appropriate for the application that you submitted. And it provides you, as I mentioned before, a clear basis upon which you can work with your partners. Moreover, we ask an estimated budget and in such detail, because should you be selected for funding, the time between the selection decision and the start of your project will be very short. Normally, uh, between the selection decision and the signature of the grant agreement, there is a period of maximum three months. If you would be starting negotiations on a more detailed budget with your partners once you know that funding is secured, it would be extremely difficult uh, to respect a three-month uh, deadline. Now, let's imagine that you have passed the selection process, so congratulations. As project leader, you have a number of very important uh, tasks. 
First of all, all partners need to understand the financial rules. It is imperative that as project leader, you send a copy of the grant agreement to your partners and that you invite your partners to uh, listen into the e-tutorial, which really explains all the details, um, all the rules that, uh, that possibly apply to our funding. I think it is, if the partners want to contribute fully to this project, it is their obligation to follow this e-tutorial. As project leader, you will need to keep track of the budget as compared to your estimated budgets because you will need to request a budget amendment, a change to the budget, should the difference become too important. And I will come back to uh, budget amendments a bit later. As project leader, you also have the responsibility to fill in our final financial statement. And it's true, this document requires a lot of detail. But this is the level of detail that your auditor will need in order to be able to produce an audit certificate, which is also something that I will come back to. The template that we provide, both for the estimated budget and for the financial statement, are mandatory. If you submit us anything else, we will not accept it. There are reasons for that, but you can imagine that if we have to work with different variations of uh, kind of financial reporting instruments, it is impossible for us uh, to deliver good work. As project leader, obviously, you will also need to keep good accounting records and ensure that supporting documents are available to ensure that costs claimed meet the conditions set by us. You have to keep in mind that if you cannot provide us with the correct supporting documents, to substantiate your, expense, your expenses, those costs will be declared ineligible, and hence your EU grants will diminish. So keep that in mind. If there is an important recommendation, the most important recommendation that I can uh, make to you today, then it is really to appoint one person responsible for financial management within one project. This is really a time-consuming task. I said I would not lie, it is demanding. Um, and you should really not underestimate it. Um, this is a task that should start right from day one when you, you get your grant agreement. It is not something that you do at the end of the project. So normally at the end of the project you have two months to submit us your final reports. If at that point you start uh, recording your expenditure in a financial statement, you're in deep trouble. Which costs are eligible for co-financing? To be eligible, costs must be incurred by one of the beneficiaries. And beneficiaries, with that we mean the project leader and the partners of the project. So the partners that are, are part, that are recognized in the grant agreement. Any cost incurred by an organization that is not part of this consortium uh, is not eligible. That is considered a third party cost, so it cannot be uh, taken into consideration unless you as project leader or one of the partners reimburses that cost to the person or to the organization. So you can work with other organizations, obviously, and we would encourage you to do that, but keep that in mind. They cannot submit you an invoice which you have not reimbursed to them. Eligible costs must be incurred in relation to an activity that is taking place during the eligibility period of the project. So we have a start date, an end date, that's the eligibility period within which you can incur expenditure. Um, there is an exception to that, the audit report, the cost for the audit report that must be sent together with uh, the final financial statement is obviously also an eligible cost. It is an important cost, so we take it into account. If you book travel tickets for an activity before the start of the eligibility period, but for an activity that takes place during the eligibility period, we will accept it, obviously, yeah, because you need to do some forward planning. But a meeting to prepare the project, to develop the project, outside of the eligibility period will not be accepted. That's upon you to develop your project. Eligible expenditure must be paid 
at the time when you submit your final uh, report. Normally it must be foreseen in your estimated budget, but there obviously is some flexibility. It must be incurred in connection uh, to the project. It must be necessary, reasonable, and justified. Reasonable, keep in mind principles of sound financial management. I think this makes sense in whichever national context uh, we're talking about. Expenditure must comply with the requirements of applicable tax and social legislation and must be identifiable and verifiable. What does that mean? The expenditure must be recorded in the accounting records of either the project leader or the partners. So all the partners and the project leader must have decent accounting systems in place. And very important, eligible costs must be correctly documented. Now I'm not going to go through the details mm -hmm. of which invoices, um, receipts, etc. you need to collect. There is information on our website. Um, there is the e-tutorial that provides this level of detail um, on the beneficiary space, which is uh, the website space that we set up for successful uh, applicants. There is also some, uh, some guidelines on that. Um, if there are specific questions, obviously I'm, uh, I can answer those, but it would take me way too far. Also, one recommendation is uh, for invoices to make reference to the project. So if you are uh, in the context of the project, you're uh, buying a service, you're giving an order to a print shop to print 2,000 brochures, ask them to put a reference uh, to the project on the invoice. That makes things crystal clear. As the project leader is responsible for overall financial management of the project, um, the partners will have to provide you with all the necessary supporting uh, documents to substantiate their expenses. And how you organize this, it's really up to you. But if I were you, I would organize reporting at regular intervals so that you can verify that partners can provide the necessary documents. So important when you have a kickoff kick meeting to set the baseline of financial reporting but inserts a process of verification along the lines because, I mean, you might end up at the end of the project with a whole set of expenditure which you cannot claim from us because you just don't have the necessary documents to back them up. Ineligible costs, almost any type of cost, if well justified and well documented, is eligible. But there are some big exceptions there is a list there, I'm not going to go through those. Maybe in your, uh, in your case, exchange losses are relevant. Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind. Suggestion maybe to open a Euro bank account. I don't know whether I should be saying that, but nevertheless, there you have it. Uh, that can save you a lot of uh, trouble. But I want to go a bit deeper into costs declared by a beneficiary in the framework of another action co-financed by the EU program. Obviously, if you have a partner that is working in two different projects, uh, both funded by us, not necessarily by the Creative Europe program, but by any other EU uh, program, for example, they, they get funding from lifelong learning and they get uh, funding from us, really make sure that a cost is not claimed twice. So no double funding. I think it is quite obvious, but I need to repeat it because we will be checking these uh, kinds of things. Contributions in kind. We get a lot of questions on contributions in kind. Um, a contribution in kind for us is a non-cash contribution to the project which can be given a measurable cash value, but which is not being paid for. So if in the context of your project, um, you get sponsoring, for example, for, from a city, um, because you're using their uh, city hall for a reception, you're getting that free of charge. This is a contribution in kind. And obviously, there is a measurable cash value behind it, but you cannot uh, claim it in, in the context of uh, our projects.
some uh, important rules and pieces of advice, exchange rate, there we have it again. Um, both your estimated budget and the final financial report need to be uh, delivered in euro. Um, check the exchange rates to be used. Uh, there is a paragraph in your grant agreement explaining you which month the exchange rate of which month you need to use, and you need to use the monthly accounting rate uh, by, used by the Commission. Uh, rules concerning exchange rate, which month to take, whether it's uh, the month of the final report, of the month of the midterm report, they have been fluctuating quite a lot. I think that we will come to a stable agreement on that uh, quite soon. But in that respect, really look into your grant agreement. There is reference uh, to exchange rates. Budget changes, so the amendments. Any change in the budget of more than 10% of the total eligible budget will require an amendment to the budget. So if you have a budget of 400,000 euros, total eligible budget of 400,000 euros, you have the possibility to shift up to 40,000 euros. So I think you have some room of manoeuvre, uh, which does not mean that you shouldn't inform us of important shifts in the budget below the 10%, because we need to make sure that the shift in your budget doesn't have any implications on the work program itself and on the outcome uh, of the project, potential outcome of the project. So you have uh, a project officer, if you have been selected for funding, you have a project officer in our office. Um, and as I said uh, before, I mean, you need to consider these people as partners in, in your project rather than as a faraway person who's only there to follow you up and tap you on the fingers when you're doing something wrong. We are really there to help you, so use us, talk to us, inform us. We are really interested in how your project is developing. So enter into communication and we will help you on any questions that you may have. I also would like to say in context of the budget changes that any change that happens within your budget can never have as a result that the total eligible budget will change. The EU grants can never increase and the percentage of co-financing is also stable. So that you always have to keep in mind. Avoid cash payments as much as possible because they're trouble. If not possible to avoid, document them well. This is really a source, I mean, we know that in certain countries, uh, cash payments are still being used quite a lot. But if you are working together with a partner set in one of those countries, really make sure that the rules for uh, providing proof for these uh, cash payments are clear from the outset. Global invoices. Imagine that you are working with a third party, so a partner that is not part of the consortium um, that is identified in the grant agreement, and this third party has quite an important role in the project. They are delivering quite a lot of work uh, for this project. Unfortunately, they cannot incur eligible costs. But rather than sending them sending you invoices one by one, you can also combine a set of invoices into a global invoice. So the third party will make up an invoice for all the costs that they incurred in the context of a festival they organized or a workshop they organized. However, there are some rules behind this. This invoice will need to provide detail of the costs incurred and will need to um, attach to the invoice the third, part, uh, third partner will need to provide uh, copies of the separate invoices related to all the expenditure and proofs of payment. So this is a way to, let's say, avoid the va-et-vient of, of invoices. You can regroup expenditure, but make sure that it's uh, very well uh, um, set up, in a sense, so with the necessary level of detail. Documents to submit at the end of the project. 
So you will need to report both on the operational side and on the financial side of uh, the project. The operational report will ask you um, how the project contributed to the objectives of the program, which activities which were implemented, what changes uh, happened as compared to the initial plan, why did, they, uh, why did these changes take place. Obviously, we will also ask you about the results of uh, the project and how many people you have reached is also important for us. We are um, inserting more and more statistical information both in our applications and in our final reports because there is a huge demand for more numbers on the Creative Europe program. Um, under, under Culture 2007, unfortunately, we have not collected enough data on the kind of project we were funding, how many people or how many organizations we were reaching, uh, through which means, what were the types of activities that we were organizing. <coughs> so it's true, we are asking a lot of information, but it is vital for the continued existence of the pro uh, program that we collect this information. Um, in terms of finances, you will need to present us with uh, the final financial statements. So, and the idea is that you complete this throughout the lifetime of the project. You start with day one, don't leave everything until the end, but there is a bit more. Not much more for projects which applied for an EU grant uh, equal or below to 60,000 euros, which is, is your case. These will just need to represent, uh, present a selection of supporting uh, documents. Projects that applied for more will need to submit an audit report, and it's possible that under cir uh, certain circumstances, you will also need to uh, present us with an audit report at the moment of an interim evaluation, which is your case. But that depends really on, on the different uh, situations that projects are in. This audit report is called Report of Factual Findings on the Final Financial Report. Every time I need to read it because I cannot remember this. Um, I will not go into the details of this document, uh, but there are guidance notes on, uh, on this report available on our website. Now, I think it's important that from the start of the project, you try to find the auditor who will produce this audit report and that you establish from the outset the baseline, the way in which you will be working. The auditor will have to get acquainted with the instructions that we give on this audit report and you can work together with him on how to structure um, not only your, your accounting system but also how are you going to store all those invoices, boarding passes, etc., etc., etc. Because you can throw them all in a box but it will not help you and it certainly will not help the auditor. So it's really good practice to contract the auditor right from the start and to establish a common way of working for the future. Who can perform this audit? The audit must be performed by someone who is recognized as an auditor under uh, national legislation. Uh, so this means that he must be qualified uh, to carry out statutory audits of accounting documents. So it's not uh, what we call an accountant, bookkeeper, it is really an auditor that uh, must perform uh, this work. It's not possible to submit several audit certificates produced by several auditors per partner. So if you have a partnership of 20 organizations, your auditor will need to certify the expenditure of the entire uh, partnership. Again, this is the reason why it's so important to establish right from the outset how you will work together with your partners in collecting uh, proof of expenditure, etc. So, a very important aspect. Our financial evaluation in EACIA will be based on the audit report and depending on the findings in this audit report, we may or we may not request additional documents.